I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 22 pro proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by me by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Urquhart. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The failure once again of the Morrison government to listen to experts and prepare for disaster season by refusing to spend a cent from their $4 billion emergency response fund and refusing to commit to developing a national aerial firefighting fleet. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Urquhart, I understand you need to move the motion. I do need opening. to move the yep. motion, and I move the motion. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. <laughs> um, over the last few decades, Tasmania has experienced a long-term drying trend that has been characterised by a 10 to 20 per cent reduction in cool seasonal rainfall. An upward trend in bushfire occurrence has also been occurring since the 1930s. The total area burned has tripled since the 1960s. In 2015, the state had, had the state's driest ever spring on record over the last 140 years and the hottest October on record, prompting an early start to the fire permit period. In 2016, a total of 229 vegetation fires were recorded from 13 January to 15 March, burning a total of area of 124 742 hectares, with a combined perimeter of 1,260 kilometres in largely remote, rugged and inaccessible areas. About 20,125 hectares, or 1.27%, of the Tasmanian World Her uh, Wilderness Heritage Area was affected by these fires, including about 1,466 hectares, or 1.8 per cent, of threatened and sensitive vegetation communities, some of which may not ever recover. Other sensitive areas, including Aboriginal and historic heritage areas, were also affected by the fires. In 2019, almost all of Tasmania recorded accumulated monthly forest fire danger indices in the highest 10 per cent of historical values for December 2019, and much of the eastern half of the state recorded its highest ever December um, forest fire danger indices FFDI, on 30 December. Several locations recorded temperatures in the high 30s and low 40s that day with several experienced the temperature record for December. Tasmania registered 406 lightning strikes that ignited dozens of bushfires that day, including a fire south of Pel Pelham in the Upper Derwent Valley, 45 kilometres northwest of Hobart. In extreme fire weather conditions, the fire spread rapidly southeast in dry forests and grasslands towards the rural communities of Eldersley and Broadmarsh. Professor, professor David M. J. S. Bowman, uh, a professor of uh, pyrogeography and fire science and director of the Fire Centre Research Hub at the University of Tasmania, wrote in his submission to the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council review of the management of Tasmanian bushfires during the 2018-19 fire season, and I'll quote. The 2018-2019 Tasmanian bushfire season conforms to a global trend of longer duration geographically larger and economically, environmentally and socially more disruptive wildfire events. The 2019 fire season also fitted an emerging syndrome of lightning ignited bushfires, lightning ignited bushfires in western Tasmania. The Tasmanian bushfire season can be understood as an expression of the Anthropocene, a new trajectory for the earth system induced by anthropogenic climate change compounded by other factors such as land use and fire regime changes. Bushfires in the Anthropocene have a trajectory that tracks away from historical norms towards more extreme events. The increased frequency of abnormal fires will significantly reduce our ability to reliably ensure clean air, supply potable water, store carbon and conserve fuels. 
The emergence of Anthropocene bushfires raise, raises profound questions for fire management and community safety and requires the development of new fire management practices to protect human life, property and infrastructure, to conserve heritage and biodiversity, to manage conservation areas and national parks, and to sustain yields from forestry, landscapes and hydroelectrical catchments. Anthropocene bushfires demand a recalibration of socio-political expectations around the capacity, effectiveness and financial costs of firefighting and fire prevention approaches, methods, methods and practices." Close the quote. So that's just in Tasmania and just in the last 14 years. Australia-wide, this last bushfire season was a horror one. The stories are still very raw. 33 lives were lost, thousands of homes destroyed, many families are still without proper shelter, hundreds of businesses destroyed, National, uh, natural values gone, many forever, whole species of native Australian flora and fauna most likely wiped out. Some of them will never recover. Over 17 million hectares had been burned across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, the ACT, Western Australia and South Australia. We all know that the government was unprepared last bushfire season. It was quite evident and the consequences were disastrous. To take just one example from the last catastrophic bushfire season, the use of the Australian Defence Forces. The Prime Minister's failures around defence were some of the most public. Let's not forget when the Prime Minister posted a polished video advertising that the government were deploying defence reservists to assist in bushfire areas. Unfortunately, he prioritised his shiny announcement video over informing Shane Fitzsimmons, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner, who found out about the massive influx of resources through the media. Mr Fitzsimmons said of the stunt, all I can say is I wasn't aware of it. I found out about it via the media reports. It is fair to say that it was disappointing and some surprised to hear about these things through public announcements. In the middle of what was one of our worst days this season, with the second highest number of concurrent emergency warning fires ever in the history of New South Wales. Then we come to the aerial firefighting capacity. For years leading up to the last bushfire season, the National Aerial Firefighting Centre pleaded with the federal government to increase their annual funding, warning that bushfire seasons were only getting more intense. For years they were ignored until last season. When finally funding arrived, it came months after the bushfires had already begun, then the federal government announced the same funding three times because we know they all love announcements. I can appreciate that the government is taking some action to address their failures from last bushfire season. What happened last year can never, ever be allowed to happen again, but it's simply not enough. And unfortunately, we also know that the government are once again putting announcements over delivery in the lead up to this natural disaster season, which is leaving us unprepared. In recent days, Australia has experienced an extreme heat wave. Dozens of fires are now burning across the country. The Bushfire and National Hazard CRC has predicted above normal fire potential across New South Wales and Western Australia throughout December 2020 to February 2021. The Bureau of Meteorology has predicted a higher than average chance of cyclones in Northern Australia, predicting that cyclone season will start earlier and be more intense. And so I come to the government's emergency response fund. 18 months ago, the Prime Minister announced a $4 billion emergency response fund designed to help fund response, recover, recovery and resilience measures in the lead up to and following natural disasters. 18 months on and not a single cent has been spent from that fund, not a single cent. Not one project amount, not one job created, not one community protected. Once again, we bear witness to this Prime Minister parent addiction to the photo up but not the follow up. The Royal Commission recently recommended that the federal government develop an Australian-based aerial firefighting capability, noting that Australia needs a sovereign aerial fleet, as we will not be able to continue relying on overseas support for much longer. This is in large due to the fact that the fire seasons globally are starting to overlap. 
The government has rejected this recommendation. They said they were comfortable with the current arrangement. And again, this was repeated by Minister Rustin in question time today in response to a question from Senator Chisholm. These arrangements have seen situations where a tiny state like Tasmania has spent $40 million on aircraft in the 2018-19 fire season alone, with contracts often having to be negotiated at the last minute and the highest possible prices. The Royal Commission also noted that last year there were instances where requests for aerial uh, assistance were not met because they simply were not available. The federal government are happy to announce the same funding three times, but they are not actually delivering the resources that Australian communities need and that the, the Australian com communities will continue to need over this uh, warm summer season that we are starting to encounter as I speak. Senator Molan. Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. And I, I rise on behalf of the government to address the MPI raised in the name of Senator Urquhart, but I think uh, by strings, pulleys and mirrors, Senator Watt was in fact talking. To begin with, I make four points. And the first point is that Labor still has no idea what they're talking about in respect of the Emergency Response Fund. Absolutely no idea what they're talking about, and they're ignoring the facts. Order. The second point. The second point I make is that they have no idea about aerial firefighting. Absolutely no idea at all. The third point I make is that they would not have a clue, in accordance with their PMPI, they would not have a clue what an expert is. And the fourth point I make is that we have prepared very well for the 2021 disaster season. Now, like Senator Urquhart and, and, and uh, like Senator Watt, I am no expert. I, uh, as a commercial helicopter pilot, I flew firebombing helicopter droppings for years, and uh, 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 I put the water on active fires. Uh, and up until I, I did this, up until a few years ago, I was also a director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, NAFC as it's called, along with the, each and every one of the commissioners of the state and territory rural fire services. Uh, and I did that for about three years. The NAFC, uh, uh, just in case Labor doesn't know, the NAFC is the organisation which leases and manages the National Aerial Firefighting Fleet, which uh, is funded, of course, by the Commonwealth, the funding of which was doubled recently. And that funding is merely the start of the funding process for funding the national fleet of aerial firefighting aircraft. And this is a fleet, of course, which Labor which Labor uh, are trying to convince us to actually develop. I also gave evidence at the Royal Commission in the 2009 Victorian fires, and I spent about 22 days down at the South Coast fires, as well as six days fighting fires throughout the ACT and Queanbey and Pellerang uh, uh, local government area. So, unlike Labor's ideological climate change activist ex-commissioners of the Rural Fire Service, which they like to quote, and I'm very surprised that you didn't quote them this time through, uh, I would like to mount a few points and to mount an informed and practical vantage point to do it. Let me develop the points I made initially. You still, as a party and as individuals, Order. have Senator, no idea— Senator Molan, let's remind you to make your remarks through the chair. Thank you, Chair. I, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, I certainly will. The Labor Party Acting Deputy President still has no idea what they're voting about when they talk about the emergency, uh, the emergency response fund. You would rather politicise that party over there in the opposition would rather politicise the issue of rural firefighting by making totally wrong and illogical claims about uh, uh, the emergency response fund. To begin with, that fund was voted for by the Labor Party. They agreed with this fund. They should have known. If they don't know, it would be very, very interesting to, to understand why they don't know about it. Because the Emergency Response Fund, you voted for it, cannot be accessed and you agreed to it until the advice is received that it, that it is required, that the money from that fund is required and all other funding sources have been depleted. That's its purpose. That's what you agreed to. The ERF, 
allows for $150 million each financial year to fund emergency response and recovery following natural disasters. And this is the kicker. When the government determines that existing recovery programs are insufficient to meet the scale of the response required, and you agreed to it, $50 million each financial year would be available from the, the, the fund to build resilience to and prepare for or reduce the risk of future natural disasters when the government determines that funding over and above its existing suite of arrangements is required and you voted for it and you agreed. So why haven't we accessed $150 million that's, that, that I've just listed? Well, it's quite simple. The government has established the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund. Some electorates, including the one I live in with an ALP member, have received more than the total $150 million allowable under the ERF. So it's an interesting situation. And I guess the question goes, why haven't we accessed the $50 million fund, the $50 million amount for, the, for mitigation? Well, the government is already spending over $260 million in joint funding with state and territory jurisdictions on resilience and on mitigation activity. And of course, the, the, the minister will always consider advice from, the emergency management, from Emergency Management Australia with regards to accessing the fund if that is required and, if so, what, what it should be spent on. Of course, we're preparing for the 2021 disaster season. And I won't go into the detail at this stage. Others will. And of course, it was gone through in great detail by the minister and by others in, uh, in Take Note today. Just, but just let me mention, uh, act, uh, Acting Deputy President, just let me mention Defence. Services Australia, disaster recovery funding arrangements changes, communications and all in a COVID environment, national disaster risk reduction framework and, of course, a royal commission. Uh, Acting Deputy President, the, 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 it, this is what preparation is about and this is what Labor should look at in order to understand preparation. So Labor's claims that we should be developing a national aerial firefighting fleet uh, is totally misplaced because it's there. You know, uh, what a disgrace to years of work of good people and financing by good governments to produce a national aerial firefighting fleet. It's a bizarre claim. Go to a fire just about anywhere and look up. If you see an aircraft, uh, as you invariably will, it will be part of our national fleet. If you don't see an aircraft, it's probably because you can't see through the smoke or it's night time. In the years that I was a director of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, in each of those years, we had roughly a minimum of 100 aircraft in the National Aerial Firefighting Fleet from the roughly 11 to $12 million that was at that time being provided by the Commonwealth Government. And of course, additional costs to this, vast additional costs, the 11 to 12 million dollars just starts the leasing project, uh, the leasing process, with additional costs paid for by the states and by the territories. Now, that 11 million dollars has become 24 million dollars. Some development. It's a bit like Labor claims that health and the ABC's budget have been reduced. This year, compared to the minimum 100, roughly. Uh, 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 aircraft when I was a director. Uh, this year, guess how many will be actually leased? Guess how many can be deployed? If needed, 158 aircraft in total are available. Some development, I reckon. Double the money and a significant increase in the number of aircraft. And of those 128 aircraft, sorry, of those 158 aircraft, 128 aircraft are Australian-based, owned, and registered. So I heard Senator Watt saying something today about him being briefed recently on aspects of this, or about to be briefed on aspects of this. It must have continually slipped his mind. And what about the Royal Commission? We, we've heard Senator Urquhart quoting the Royal Commission there. Uh, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3. On 8.2, research and evaluation, we're doing it. 8.3, support and development, of course we're doing it. 
We have already done it. I guess I would prefer, in the few seconds I've got left, to move away from ideological climate change ex-commissioners and find some knowledgeable experts. And that is what I would recommend, Acting Deputy President, the Labor Party do. The Commonwealth is not and should not be going to get into aerial firefighting, except to coordinate and to fund, and that is what they do. So, Acting Deputy President, uh, we reject entirely the proposition in today's MPI, and uh, 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 my colleagues will further argue the case on all of those points. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, speak on the MTI, MPI. Uh, I, I do note that uh, Senator Urquhart talked about a long-term uh, trend uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the fire seasons, which are becoming uh, worse and longer in duration. Uh, that all is very, very clear. I think uh, everyone accepts that. But I want, to talk, I want to talk about a static problem, a static issue, because as long as I can remember looking at the, uh, at the aerial firefighting service, uh, we've seen a fire season commence, and then we've seen a whole bunch of very sophisticated, very capable aircraft or helicopters fly in from overseas. They fly in from overseas and they, uh, they, they, they deliver this firefighting capability. And uh, you know, that all might sound good. Perhaps uh, we, we suggest we're leasing these aircraft rather than purchasing them. But the reality is we have a long-term need. And the other reality is that we're paying a huge premium, particularly in circumstances as the load varies, for some of these aircraft. So what we've got here, what people need to understand is going on here, is when there's a fire, as you see the fire trucks racing towards the fire, there's a money truck racing to the ports. A big truck full of taxpayers' money that is going to the ports of Australia and getting shipped off overseas. And that's what's happening. The only uh, you know, the, the only thing that fetters or stops these trucks get rolling onto, the, onto the, the ferries to head off overseas is there's a submarine, future submarine project truck in front of them, or a Watergate truck in front of them. So we ship all our money off overseas. And let me tell you why this, what, you know, what, what the tragedy uh, here is. I know a number of Australian businessmen, people who work in the aviation industry, who would love to stand up an aerial firefighting capability. But because the contracts that are issued by the, con by the Commonwealth are so short, they go along to their bank and say, I would like to, 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 to purchase a, an asset, a helicopter, a large uh, aerial tanker. And the bank looks at them and says, sorry, you've only got a two-year contract. The Commonwealth know that this is going to go on year after year after year. Simply extending the contract term uh, to a reasonable time frame would permit these Australian companies to invest with the, with the support of banks. But no, we don't do that. We, we trickle out money on a short-term basis, which just absolutely favours the overseas entities, because they've made the investment. They've got contracts in their home jurisdictions. And that's a fundamental problem that we need to look at. This problem could be solved simply by changing the, the, the length of the contract terms. We would have more Australians investing in capability that was resident here. And you know what? When other jurisdictions were having fires, we'd be sending them overseas and they would uh, you know, be making money, bringing money back to Australia. And that's what needs to be happening, and that's what's missing here. This is, this is the responsibility of, of the federal government. You heard Senator Molan say that the funding comes from uh, federal government coffers. Yeah, we kind of recognise that this is a national uh, process, yet we, we kind of uh, hide behind the fact that we're, we're getting the states uh, individually to look at these things, yet uh, in actual fact we, we're trying to create national emergency laws. We've got the, the ADF does a fantastic job weighing in. We've got CASA. We, uh, yeah, we've got federal funding going to the firefighting, the aerial firefighting service. We need to take charge of this. 
We need to take charge. We need to have a sovereign, a sovereign firefighting capability, aerial firefighting capability. And it's not too hard to do. I've given the answer in my, uh, in my contribution today. Just a few tweaking of contract terms and the problem would be solved because Australian businessmen and women would then stand up the capability here. Every time we issue a short-term contract for an aerial firefighting service, we cut off our nose in spite of our face. We have to fix this. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I, watching uh, Senator Molan's contribution, I guess I finally grasped why this government has been unable to act in the interests of Australians in regional areas. So fixed in the past, so stuck in his views, so unable to recognise that times have changed, that the climate has changed, that the management of country has changed, or the requirements for effective management of country, and the requirements for effective firefighting have so fundamentally changed, only response from Senator Mullen is the same as the response from the Prime Minister. It's bluster, it's obfuscate, it's point the finger at somebody else. It is never take charge, take responsibility and act. Well, there are many communities this week who are beginning their one-year commemoration of the bushfire season coming to them. And people in Braidwood today are doing that. And for people in Braidwood, the fires started this week, 12 months ago, but they went all the way through to February. Some people having their properties burnt out multiple times. And what those communities want to hear is not bluster, it's not ideology, it's not politicisation, it's not pointing the finger at the states and saying, I don't hold a hose, mate. What they want to see is action, leadership, and effective coordination from the Commonwealth. The Bushfire and Nat Natural Hazards CRC outlook for December to February notes that while the East Coast has experienced wetter than average conditions since last summer, normal fire conditions still persist because of long-term dryness. Half of New South Wales west of the dividing range will experience above normal fire conditions this summer because while the ideal conditions for cropping and pasture growth are great news for our farmers. They create the ideal conditions in mid to late summer for very dangerous, fast-moving grass fires. The ACT in southern Monaro will experience similar conditions. Drought conditions persist in southern Western Australia. As summer progresses the southwest, the Swan Coastal Plain and parts of the Wheat Belt and Esperance Plains will experience higher than normal fire potential. Nowhere in the country will experience below normal fire potential. Well, what does normal mean? Normal means that somewhere in Australia over the coming summer, people will lose their homes to fire, businesses will be destroyed, and in the worst cases, lives will be lost. The summer of 1974 to 1975 was a normal fire season, and 117 million hectares burned. The summer of 1984 to 85 was a normal fire season. In New South Wales alone, three and a half million hectares burned, 40,000 head of sheep and cattle perished, and four people were killed. The summers between 1993 and 1994, and also 1998 to 99 were normal. In all, 19 people were killed, and scores of houses were burned to the ground. The summer of 2002-2003 was a normal fire season. Four people perished and 488 homes were burned to the ground right here in Canberra. The summer of 2008-2009 was a normal fire season. 173 people died on Black Saturday, 7th of February 2009. The summer of 2015-2016 was a normal fire season. 
It was the most destructive season since 2008-2009. Nine people were killed, nearly a thousand buildings destroyed, and the fires had a catastrophic impact on Tasmania's world heritage areas. The summer of 2013-2014 was a normal season, but the alarm bells were truly, were well and truly ringing this time. It was only in October 2013 in the Blue Mountains where two people died, 208 homes destroyed and 86,000 hectares, including World Heritage Areas, burned. These are the normal seasons that are becoming increasingly infrequent. Above normal fire conditions are the new normal. How much more unnecessary death and destruction will there have to be before this government gets out of its Hawaii state of mind? There is almost nobody outside the Morrison government who doesn't think that Australia should have its own national, sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. You go in the main street of Braidwood or a pub in Cabago uh, or a supermarket in Taree uh, or the rural fire service in Nowra and you try and find a single person who doesn't think, who doesn't know that Scott Morrison's job is not to produce television ads trying to glorify and obscure, glorify action and obscure the fact that he got caught out refusing to come back from overseas holidays while houses were being burnt out and the country needed him uh, and whatever leadership he was capable of providing, you won't find a soul who doesn't think that we need a national sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. Like in every case, where the issue is about the government's responsibility to keep Australians safe, the Morrison government thinks it's the state's responsibility. You can hear them up in the back rows there. Whenever these issues become uncomfortable, they point to the states. Well, I can tell you, bushfire fighting, bushfire preparedness is a national emergency, a national crisis, and it requires national leadership and a national response. Apparently, for Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, the government's got no role to play other than to offer paltry, late and inadequate funding announcements with no follow-up, just spin. It took 12 hours for the Prime Minister's office to produce a slick social media ad at the height of the crisis, when the Prime Minister was trying to run from his responsibility, all of this year it has been as clear as that this national sovereign air, air fleet is required and no action from the Commonwealth Government. The Senate Finance and Public Administration inquiry in last summer's bushfires has heard compelling evidence that a national aerial firefighting fleet must be a high priority of the national government. The Prime Minister himself gave support for the proposition when he said on January 4 this year, what we need are water bombers that meet the technical and specific requirements of the deployment in Australia. It's not just a matter of trying to hustle up some planes from somewhere around the world. What you need is the precise asset to deal with the situation in Australia. That's what he said. Just more words, empty words, no delivery. That's exactly what a sovereign national air, for air firefighting fleet would do. It would meet our specific technical requirements. It would be there all of the time as a precise asset to deal with the situation in Australia. But of course, all people in regional Australia have had from this Prime Minister is empty words and avoidance. Rather than each state and territory sourcing its own aerial firefighting fleet, it would be far more efficient and far more effective to build a national capability for all Australians, one that's capable of moving between the states and territories over the course of a bushfire season, one that's capable of responding early 
to fires that have historically been left to burn out of control in wilderness areas because they've been inaccessible and have then turned into the frightening, devastating fires that, for example, enveloped the community of Cabago a little less than 12 months ago. This is a government without a strategy for, everything, for anything. It's a government that points the finger and bludges off the states and territories, is never capable of doing its job and exercising its responsibility in the interests of all Australians. Uh, and you lot are never capable of doing anything else but pointing the finger at, at everybody else. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And what we heard from Senator Ayres there was the masterclass in deflection. A masterclass in deflection. And can I say uh, that it is quite tawdry the behaviour of the Labor Party in the last 12 months in their response to the bushfire crisis last year. You know, I well remember the worst bushfires in my lifetime were actually in 2009 when we had 180 Victorians killed on uh, Black Saturday. That was six times the amount, and, and with respect to everyone uh, who passed away, uh, that happened. Um, uh, and for throughout that year, there was no partisanship from the coalition when the Rudd government was in power to somehow make out that it was the Rudd government's fault for the for the loss of those lives. Okay. Yet this year, we've had a non-stop barrage of blame from the Labor Party, as though Scott Morrison actually lit those fires himself. And can I say that is as disgusting and tawdry behaviour for politicians who represent the people and should know better. And I didn't hear once one solution offered by Senator Ayres in that speech there. All it was was smear and endowendo, which is the uh, modus operandi of the Labor Party. And bushfires and emergency management shouldn't be used as a, as a political football, football to score political points. Now, you know, can I also say that Senator Ayres' comments that you know, this government believed that we had no role to play is an absolute insult to the Australian Army and military who participated so gallant, uh, bravely through those bushfires in logistics, coordination, communication, uh, in helping people um, resettle. Uh, so, can, you know, I, I really think Senator Ayres should apologise to the Australian mil military because we put the, uh, you know, the Australian government was more than willing to get the military involved, um, despite the fact, despite what Senator Ayres says, um, and I accept. I think last year was had a particular uniqueness in the extent that the, the fires were widespread. And there is no doubt that when you have a national emergency like that, the army should be involved. But can I say that, you know, talking about the fires, I noticed Senator Ayres uh, didn't mention 1939, the, the bushfires, the bushfires in 1939, or the bushfire, the Black Friday of 1939, or the bushfires of the 1850s that wiped out a quarter of uh, Victoria or burnt a quarter of Victoria. Um, so a bit of selective uh, picking there as well. But we have to get to the heart of the problem here, and that, of course, is the state governments and their woeful management of their responsibilities. So, first of all, let's, let's just have a look at the emergency services. Who's responsible for emergency services? State governments. And who's been cutting funding to emergency services for the last 20 years? State governments. And, you know, it doesn't help when we have retired bureaucrats who are in that, uh, you know, for an emergency role in New South Wales coming out and slagging off the government when this particular bureaucrat himself was actually head of the uh, New South Wales emergency response um, for, from 2003 to 2017, the uh, New South Wales Fire Brigade. And a lot of this stuff happened under his watch, and he was more, willing, more than willing to come out when the bushfires was on and blame everyone else. Um, the second thing is, and this is something that's very close to my heart, is the poor land management undertaken by states over the last 20 or 30 years, where uh, farmers and, in particular, uh, state governments have not managed their national parks. 
properly. Now, I, can, I know two areas in Queensland, one just near where I currently live. Uh, there's a lot of national parks there, and the parks are full of lantana. It is infested with weeds because the state governments won't get in there and clean it up. I mean, we have got a real lantana problem in our national parks in Queensland. And the other thing we've got in Queensland is a actual overgrowth, lack of uh, hazard reduction burning. And I know in our, uh, our property out in Western Queensland, we've got a big uh, national park next to us and it's just full of pests. You know, the pigs come through, the goats come through, feral cats, wild dogs. It's not being looked after. It's not being looked after. And this is becoming more and more of a concern because the land uh, used by agriculture has dropped from 500 million acres in 1976 to, to 390 million acres today. And a lot of that land has either been locked up or converted to national parks. Now, out in southwestern Queensland, this, this particular part of Australia is punching way above, it, above its weight in earning carbon credits. And that is unfortunately to the detriment of great towns like Quilpie and Charleville who are losing uh, shires, uh, sorry, who are losing um, constituents in their shires because the mulga is being locked up for carbon farming, which means that we're going to have more and more um, undergrowth, we're going to have more and more feral pests because the farmers aren't there managing it, uh, and we're going to have a much greater fire hazard. And of course, this is the price that is paid, as usual, by regional Queensland and the regional parts of Australia that they are the ones whose livelihoods suffer uh, in order to fill the green dream. And unfortunately, you know, one of these days, you know, if it ever gets, uh, goes off out there, it's going to go on. So state governments have got to do more about hazard reduction. The other uh, part that you know, state governments have failed to uh, manage properly is, of course, zoning approvals. I mean, state governments will approve uh, housing commission blocks in both flood and fire zones. And it's, it's becoming a, uh, a very bad problem. I know in Townsville in the floods last year, houses were wiped out in the floods because they were built in flood zones. And I know that a lot of houses today are being built, unfortunately, among the gum trees. Now, where I live, I, I go through the back way around um, through um, Sanford Conservation Park, and there are houses in there that are literally amongst the gum tree. Like, the house is there, and every one of these seats around us are the trees. And if, if there's ever a fire, I don't know how these people are going to get out. And why they're allowed to live there is, is, is beyond me, um, and it worries me a lot. And, of course, the fourth failure um, by state governments is the fact that they've all sold their state uh, government insurance offices. So, you know, you want to wonder why we can't get insurance in North Queensland. It's because the state government sold the state uh, government insurance office. I mean, I think we probably can all remember the SGIOs in various different states. I mean, that was there to provide insurance where the private sector wouldn't. And of course, the neoliberals in the in the, in the Labor Party, and I admit we had a few in the Liberal Party, but believe it or not, in Queensland, it was all, all done by Labor. Um, you know, flogged all that off to the private sector. So insurance there is another problem as well. Now, rather than continue to peddle hysteria and everything. What we need to do is to look at preventative measures. We need to look at preventative measures. Now, apart from the measures I've just talked about, some of the other things we need to do is to stop planting eucalypt trees. Now, it, it seems hard to imagine, but Landcare love to go around and plant eucalypt trees. Now, the, the last thing we need in this country are any more eucalypt trees. There's plenty of other Australian natives you can plant um, that aren't full of eucalypt oil that, when you light a fire, are going to explode. So that is something I think, and I've, I've actually written a, a letter up to the minister, the environment minister today, um, asking her to address that issue um, because I think that's very important. But just in concluding, I, I think the other thing we've got to look at the start, the cause of that uh, Victorian bushfire in 2009 was actually determined to be a fallen transmission line, a fallen transmission line. Now you know. A part of the clean green dream is to have more renewable uh, energy, and of course that is going to require $100 billion to be spent to build all the transmission lines to get the energy from all the disparate uh, uh, energy generation into the cities. Now, more transmission lines is going to mean a much greater fire hazard. 
because not only can you have fallen transmission lines, they're also those big towers of uh, lightning conductors. So, you know, it's kind of ironic that we've got the left over here saying that we've got to do something about fires and everything like that, and they actually want to increase the risk of fires by having more and more transmission lines. So I hope that they've taken into account the cost of putting this stuff underground. I hope these transmission lines that we build for all these renewable power stations aren't going to be built through towers because you're going to increase fire risk. And then, of course, there's solar panels. And we know that there's a lot of shoddy, uh, dodgy imported solar panels, and it's been discussed by. Um, I've got an article here where a Victorian uh, firefighter has discussed the fact that a large number of uh, fires uh, today has been caused by shoddy solar panels on houses that cause fires. So, you know, these guys need to take a good hard look in the mirror and come up with some solutions Thank for a change very instead much, of throwing Senator blame. Rennick. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, one thing I do agree with Senator Rennick on is we do need to take a lot more preventative actions around fire and fire risk. And the most important thing we can do is act on climate change. Act on climate change. And I was very surprised that the Liberal Party would put up a speaker like Jim, Senator Jim Molan today, who is on record as being a climate sceptic, climate denier, whatever you want to call it. And it just shows why we are in such a mess, why we have a government who refuses to take climate change seriously. We're never going to solve this problem. And I wanted to say today that it was actually Senator McKim and myself in 2016, and I remember it was the day we launched our double dissolution election campaign in Tasmania. We launched a policy for the Australian government to buy uh, water bombers. And the reason we did that was because Tasmania had had a horrendous summer of fires in 2016, a horrendous summer of fires. And we, Senator McKim had initiated a Senate inquiry to look at those fires and the responses. And it was public knowledge made in that inquiry that we couldn't get aerial water bombers when we needed them in Tasmania. And in 2016, we had 145 separate fires that burned for over 63 days, destroying 126,800 hectares of mostly remote vegetation, 19,800 hectares of that which was in the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. In 2018 and 19, the bushfires burned for 100 days destroying 210,000 hectares of mostly remote vegetation, again 95,000 hectares of which was in the Tasmanian World Heritage Area. And these are the only forests in the world that are World Heritage protected. And some of them had vegetation that were thousands of years old that had never seen fire, never seen fire in their time as living, breathing plants on this planet. Both of these catastrophic fire events began with dry lightning strikes. Increasingly rare dry lightning strikes have caused a lot of damage, not just in Tasmania but elsewhere. Another thing linked directly by the bomb to our changing climate. 2016 was the hottest Tasmanian summer on record at the time and the driest spring on record. 2019 was again the hottest summer on record, which eclipsed 2016, following again the driest spring on record. We also, uh, Acting Deputy President, initiated a Senate inquiry looking at the implications for climate change on Australia's national security. And we took significant evidence right around this country on why climate change is the biggest threat to this country's national security and what we needed to do about it. And we had a very productive discussion on buying our own fleet of aerial bombers. And the Greens worked this policy up. We took it to the 2019 election, just like we did in 2016. And I commend Labor for adopting another Greens policy. We see it all the time, and it's great. Sometimes I think our role in here is to get the Labor Party on board, and we succeeded with that. And I hope we actually now get this aerial uh, water bombing fleet that we so desperately need in this country. What we learnt in our Senate inquiry very quickly, Acting Deputy President, is that with overlapping fire seasons around the world, we cannot rely on bringing planes in from overseas. We pay an exorbitant amount of money to lease these aircraft. We have no control 
over when they get here or when they're used. We should have our own fleets, even if it has to be housed in the RAAF. It doesn't really matter. We need to own these. They should be owned by the Australian taxpayer. They should be on standby for Australians. And everybody has seen that. The Royal Commission has recently reflected that. There's no reason that we don't have our own aerial firefighting fleet except for ideology, uh, both an ideology around privatising and outsourcing everything in this country to the private sector to make a big buck. And the ideology we have seen on display today, disgusting, almost hard to believe, from a government that actually puts up climate deniers in this chamber to talk about preparedness and readiness for extreme weather events and the risks to Australians from wildfire. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I don't know about everybody else, but I love summer. And I can remember the feeling of Christmas coming and singing a beautiful hymn at my Catholic school in the lead up to Christmas. Words are written by John Wheeler and the music's from William G. James, and these are the words. The north wind is tossing the leaves. The red dust is over the town. The sparrows are under the eaves, and the grass in the paddock is brown. As we lift up our voices and sing to the Christ child, the heavenly king. Well, I tell you what we're not going to get for Christmas. We're going to get the heat, but we're not going to get the protection that Australians deserve. And we're not going to get it even that was recommended to this government, because Mr Morrison is a phony. He'll be there for all the photos, but when it comes to delivering the things that really matter, he is a man constantly missing in action. There's plenty of announcement, but when communities across this country will be looking to the sky, praying for aerial firefighting support, there will be none because Mr Morrison decided we didn't need it. That's the sort of prime minister that we've got a man who ignores the experts, a man who ignores the evidence, a man who treats Australians with contempt. I guarantee that there will be Australians this year who are standing in their street fighting for their community, fighting to save their own houses and the houses of the community that they serve through their firefighting efforts. They will be looking skyward for a missing in action aerial firefighting fleet. And there can be only one person who has to be held accountable for that, and it is the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. We've heard all the announcements, and there is such a hope amongst Australians that after we see the terrible fires that we saw last summer, when there was an announcement by our Prime Minister of $4 million in an emergency response fund, we all thought, oh, how wonderful that our taxpayers' dollars are going to help people in the community, our fellow Australians who really need the help. But Mr Morrison, has, Morrison hasn't spent any of that money. There's a long way between announcement and delivery with this government, and they are failing us every single day. On the beautiful central coast where I live, there was a huge effort, a heroic effort, by rural fire service volunteers who fought the Three Mile Fire. I was up in Mangrove Mountain recently, and I know the connectivity issues that plagued their capacity to save that community are still happening today, because Mr Morrison doesn't think it's worth investing in proper connectivity for fire services and for that community. How can, how can this Prime Minister pretend to stand up for bushfire-affected communities when he cannot provide them even the most basic infrastructure, the lack of telecommunication capacity in this 21st century, year 2020, putting lives at risk, both the residents of those areas that will be attacked by bushfires and the lives of those who want to serve our community by fighting the fires that will always come when those hot winds blow. 
For years leading up to the last bushfire season, the National Aerial, Aerial Firefighting Centre has pleaded with the federal government to increase their annual funding, warning that bushfire seasons were only going to get more intense. And they were right. This is not a new request of the government. This is a long-standing request, and all this government has offered to our brave service workers is sophistry and spin. I can tell you that when Christmas comes around this year, Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister who had to hire an empathy consultant for nearly $200,000 so he could learn to sympathise with drought-affected farmers, will be calling on those pretend skills once again. He is so dodgy. So dodgy, you cannot trust a word that comes out of his mouth. And when fire hits our communities across this country this summer, remember the man who has ignored pleas for years for an aerial firefighting fleet. Remember the man who's sending us into debt to the tune of $1 trillion, who couldn't find enough money to provide aerial firefighting. That's who Scott Morrison is. And no announcement regime and no amount of sophistry will be able to pull the wool over the Australian people's eyes indefinitely. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. I'll just it being perilously close to 5 p.m. Um, I'll give senators a moment to enter the chamber before we move on to the first speech. Because we were scheduled to start at five. Thanks, Senator Van, for his understanding. We'll get back to the MPI after this event. Pursuant to order, I will now call Senator Thorpe to make her first speech, and I ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the gathering place on which this parliament was built. I am a proud Japuran Gunai Gunditjmara woman, and I live on Wurundjeri country. I stand before you today on the shoulders of my ancestors who fought and died for our country. Their resistance, their knowledge and strength over thousands of years has guided me to this moment, and I carry their spirit with me in this chamber. It's an honour to be the first Aboriginal person elected to the Senate to represent Victoria. While it's a great shame that it has taken this long, the timing could not be more significant. Outside these walls, a global movement has taken to the streets to, to demand that black lives matter. An uprising of voices united by the conviction that the colour of your skin should not limit your potential, your safety or your life expectancy. That was not something society told me growing up. For an Aboriginal girl raised in poverty and public housing, who left school at 14, the idea that I could make it all the way to this nation's parliament was laughable. People like me were not meant to end up in places like this. Our voices were silenced, sidelined and written out of the story of our own country. But I never gave up believing that better days were possible. I come from a long line of strong black women who taught me to stand up for what's right and never let injustice and racism beat you down. If you want change, you have to fight for it. I've been a human rights, climate and forest activist, and in 2017 I was honoured to be the first Aboriginal woman elected to the Victorian Parliament. I've fought my whole life for those without a voice. My promise to the people of Victoria is I will continue to fight for you. And I will never forget where I come from. I take my seat in this chamber today for every person who has been discarded, discounted or left behind. It's time for your voices to be heard. For too long, power has been tightly held in the hands of the privileged. I come to this parliament not as a career politician, but as someone who's done it tough and grown strong through the struggles. I'm a survivor of family and workplace violence. 
I was a single mum at 17, and I've had to confront my own mental health issues, and I know what it's like to count every cent to put food on the table. Millions of people all over this country face similar challenges every day. They need a parliament that prioritises their right to live with dignity. Instead, they have been forgotten by a political class that sees poverty as a character flaw. It doesn't have to be this way. Right now, we have a chance to build a country that works for everyone, not just the chosen few. We stand at a crossroads. 2020 will leave an enduring mark in the pages of history. This was a year that demanded we not turn our heads from the challenges that threaten our future and, yes, the urgency of a climate emergency. The growing economic inequality exposed and exacerbated by a deadly global pandemic and the ongoing fight for racial justice. For Australia to become a mature, self-assured nation, we must recognise the long history of violence inflicted upon this country's first people and embark on a truth-telling journey to reconcile that past. These challenges are big, but so is the opportunity. This is our moment to grow as a nation, and we must be brave. The devastating bushfires that ripped through this land were a wake-up call for those who deny we must act decisively to address the reality of a warming planet. We have watched in real time the full horror of the climate crisis and what happens when you stop caring for country. With governments of the world converging on Glasgow next November to lift their ambition on climate action, the denial, the posturing and fidgeting that has gone on in this House for far too long must stop now. It's time for leadership. We must put the future of our children, our grandchildren and country ahead of the short-term interests of the fossil fuel industry. Last year, I attended the United Nations Climate Summit in Madrid and saw firsthand how big polluters are poisoning country and ripping the heart out of communities all over the world. And I also saw firsthand how this government is holding the world back when it comes to global action on climate change. At a meeting of Indigenous leaders, we wept as we shared our collective grief over the destruction of our land, from the fires tearing through the Amazon to the devastation in our own backyard. Here in Australia, we have seen Rio Tinto blow up the Jukun Gorge in the Pilbara, blasting 46,000-year-old Aboriginal rock shelters in an act of cultural and environmental vandalism. And we know they have more planned. In Western Victoria, ancient birthing trees are being destroyed. At this site, on Japwarung country, Aboriginal women have given birth to an estimated 10,000 babies over many centuries. My ancestors' blood runs through the soil that nourishes these trees. When we lose these sacred sites, we sever the deep spiritual ties that connect our culture and language to this land. Caring for country is at the heart of who we are as Aboriginal people, as custodians of this land for thousands of years. We understand the health of the community is only as strong as the health of our environment. We're tired of watching governments and their agencies pay lip service to an acknowledgement of country. 
while at the same time destroying the very land they claim to respect. When we don't show genuine care for the country that nurtures us, we all suffer. And that's why we can't separate climate justice from First Nations justice. We can't maintain the protection of our land if its traditional custodians are locked up, dis disenfranchised and dying in the numbers that represent an outrageous human rights abuse. To heal this land, we must address the inequality and injustice faced by Aboriginal people. Black Lives Matter needs to be more than a trending hashtag. It must be a reckoning, a line in the sand, a call to action to those whose skin colour affords them greater safety and justice, it's time to stop looking away from systemic racism and stand with us and say no more. George Floyd's death was that moment for many people. I take hope from the spirit of solidarity that was born from this rising consciousness. But why did it take the death of a black man on the other side of the world to wake up Australia, when our Indigenous people are the most incarcerated people on earth? We must now ensure that history also remembers the names of those who died in similar circumstances right here in Australia. John Pat, David Dungai, Miss Jew, Joyce Clark, Kuman J. Walker, Veronica Nelson Walker, Tanya Day, and Raymond Noel Thomas, just to name a few. I wish I was afforded the time in this speech to name every life taken. 441 Aboriginal people have died in custody since the Royal Commission in 1991. Not a single person has ever been held accountable. For years, politicians in this parliament have talked about closing the gap. But our children continue to be removed from their homes at rates higher than white Australia. In fact, over 20,000 of our babies aren't with their families or their communities. Kids as young as 10 are held cr criminally responsible in this country. The vast majority of them are Aboriginal. Our babies should be playing and learning, not incarcerated for petty offences like stealing a chocolate bar. These are not just statistics on a page for me. Earlier this year, I went home to grieve with my mother and our community on Gunai country what the colonisers called Gippsland. Four Aboriginal people had been lost to suicide in 10 days. These tragedies reflect a profound sense of hopelessness felt by many First Nations people when they look to a future that holds little promise. Three of those young people had connections to Lake Tyres, a community where generations earlier my mother's family were in prison as imprisoned as refugees in their own country. It happened as part of the systematic slaughter of Aboriginal people across this nation. In Victoria alone, there were 67 massacres and more are still being uncovered. They tried to wipe my people from this land, but they failed. We are still here. We are the oldest living culture in the world, and our fight for survival is part of this nation's story. White Australia has a black history. We cannot change the past, but we can build a better future. We must reckon with our history so we can heal and move forward as one country united by truth and common purpose. I believe Australia is ready to come with us on this journey. 
For the last two years, I've led a dawn service on January 26 to mark a day of mourning and honour all the Aboriginal men, women and, yes, children who were massacred upon invasion of this country, known as the Frontier Wars. The vast majority of people standing shoulder to shoulder with us have been non-Indigenous Australians, sharing our grief in a spirit of healing. Their numbers grow each year. But to truly bring this country together, we must not only treat the symptoms of disadvantage, but the cause. We do this with a treaty. A treaty is a written agreement between sovereign nations, and Australia is the only Commonwealth country without one with its first people. If we write it together, treaty can be a blank canvas to reframe the story of who we want to be as a country. We can celebrate what unites us, protect the rights of First Nations people, and acknowledge injustices, both past and present. There can be no justice without peace. Treaty could bring that peace. It would end the suffering and heal the wounds. That's why treaty must come before other debates, such as constitutional recognition, changing the date of Australia Day, or a voice to parliament. Because the disadvantage and inequality we face as a community are not due to inherent failings in our character. They are symptoms of the persecution and oppression this country and its constitution were founded upon. We can't be included in the constitution before this chapter in Australia's history has been resolved via a treaty. And we mustn't replicate tick and flick domestic treaties that allow native title to be extinguished to make way for the destruction of country for mega mines, logging or fracking. A genuine national treaty would elevate Aboriginal voices and reframe us as a more caring society where nobody is left behind. We need to make that shift because the gap between rich and poor is growing wider. The unprecedented public health and economic crisis we're living, in through, living through in 2020 has brought this into sharp focus. It has often been said that the COVID-19 virus doesn't discriminate, but we know now its impacts do. Young people, women, migrants, the elderly, public housing residents and casualised workers are bearing the greatest burden. I want to offer my condolences to the families of those whose lives have been tragically cut short by coronavirus. Through this crisis, we have seen that inequality is not just a social issue, it's a major public health risk that eats away at the fabric of our society. Precarious work and insecure housing have fuelled this pandemic. When you have low-paid, casualised workforce, inevitably people will be forced to make choices that have life and death consequences. Staying home when you're sick is not an option when that decision means your children go without food. Too many people are living hand to mouth without job security or the dignity of a living wage. COVID has exposed deep cracks in our society, showing how quickly it can fall apart when people have no safety net. As we endured periods of lockdown, I think of all the people who are permanently locked up and forgotten about by our government, like my friends Farhad and Moz, Kurdish refugees who spent seven years on Manus Island before being brought to Australia under Medivac legislation, 
They are now locked inside a Melbourne hotel room with no prospect of release and fighting for basic rights. These men have committed no crime. How can we as a nation treat people like this? We are stronger as a country when we extend the hand of friendship to everyone, not just those who look like you, not just those who wear the same school tie as you. That is what this parliament should be about, a place that represents everyone equally. Because what COVID has shown us is that economic inequality is not an individual moral failing, but an active political choice. The disaster in private aged care is a tragic reminder of what happens when we put the profits of big business over the dignity of our community's most vulnerable. Who's been looking after our elders? Not this place. But it should have been. Through this pandemic, we have seen governments find money to house the homeless, feed the hungry, support the unemployed, prop up childcare and boost mental health services. These solutions to social and economic disadvantage have always been there. Our political leaders have just chosen not to adopt them. We deserve so much better, and we can be better. This pivotal moment has offered us a unique opportunity to reimagine our society. From the ashes of the crisis, we can rebuild in a way that addresses our overriding national challenges. Justice for First Nations people, reducing inequality and addressing climate change. We can create a community where the collective good outweighs individual self-interest. As we look, look to that future, I think of the lessons we can learn from the matriarchs in my family. My great-grandmother, Edna Brown, arrived in Melbourne on the back of a truck in 1932 after being forced off the Framlingham Aboriginal Reserve near Warrnambool as part of the White Australia assimilation policy during the Great Depression. Back then, it was common for Aboriginal people to be buried as paupers in unmarked graves. Nan Edna wanted to offer the dignity in death that so many of our people were denied in life. She set up the Aboriginal Funeral Fund, supporting families to bury their loved ones. After Nan Edna, her daughter, my Nan Alma Thorpe, was one of the founders of the, Aboriginal, the first Aboriginal health service in Victoria in 1973, the year I was born. To this day, that service is still saving lives. That is kinship. It is self-determination and strength through community. And then there's my mum, Marjorie Thorpe, a co-commissioner for the Bringing Them Home Stolen Generation Inquiry and a member of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, which inspired a quarter of a million people to walk across the Sydney Harbour Bridge in 2000 in a powerful gesture of social solidarity. This is where I come from. As I followed these strong women, I learned through one of the toughest periods of my life that strength comes from community. Living in the Collingwood Commission flats saved my life. Public housing helped me escape family violence and gave me and my son the safety and stability I needed to get a job and pursue further education. That is what everyone deserves, a, place, a safe place to call home, secure work, food in their belly and the hope of a future with potential. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that our society is weaker when people don't have these basic rights. The people in this chamber have the power to change that. We can do more of the same, or we can offer our kids and grandkids 
a politics of hope. The solutions to the big problems we face are there in the way my people have looked after each other for generations. Holistic health care, caring for country, kinship and self-determination. We can give everyone the dignity of a living wage and lift people out of poverty. And it's not too late to tackle the climate emergency, but we can't be fooled by a gas-led recovery backed by both sides of this House. The only so safe road out of our economic and climate crisis is one that creates thousands of jobs in renewable energy. We can write a treaty that acknowledges our past and brings us together to heal as a nation. That's why I'm here, to fight for the change that will unite and strengthen our country. I will be a senator for all of us. To our LGBTIQ community, know that I've got your back. Together we won marriage equality, but the fight for your rights is not over, particularly for trans and gender diverse people. To the activists fighting to protect our country, climate and human rights, I stand with you. To all those women who have been trapped, who have been made to feel worthless or unsafe, who have been told time after time to sit down and be silent, whether in your home, your workplace or wherever you go, I see you, I have been you and I will not forget you. To Greens members and voters who have backed me on this journey, I thank you. I chose the Greens as my political home because it's a grassroots movement that won't sell out to vested interests that have corrupted our democracy. And I'd like to pay tribute to the person whose shoes I now fill, Richard Di Natale, a leader of great integrity and passion Thank you for your service and support. I also pay my respects to other First Nations MPs who have walked this road before me. And I thank my sisters Arika and Mariki, my partner Gavin, my children Andrew, Kawira and Kayan, my daughter-in-law Jackie, don't cry, and my granddaughters, Aluka, Nakaya, and nephew Cadell, for loving and supporting me through this journey and for your sacrifices that got me here. Finally, to every person watching today, particularly those who have lost hope in politics as a vehicle for change, I say this to you. Change is possible. Hold me and every other elected representative in this place accountable. Our job is to serve you. We have an opportunity to build a stronger, more unified nation. And I invite you all to come on this journey with me, a journey of truth-telling, healing and justice. Together, we can build a brighter future, and I'm here to fight for it. Thank you.
Uh, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I rise to speak on this motion. I, and again, I find myself thanking a senator on the other side for putting on, up an MPI, which really, for us, is just a Dorothy Dixer. It's really quite amazing. And it's quite ironic that the Labor Party want to bring this topic up as, it, as we enter another disaster season. Politicising disaster preparedness, response and recovery is nothing new for the Australian Labor Party. After all, we know they have form in this space, especially in my home state of Victoria. The Andrews government's so-called reforms of the fire services at the behest of their union mates undermined the coordination of firefighting across the state last fire season, especially in the regional cities and has led to poor morale, loss of expertise and the decimation of volunteers in our beloved country fire authority. Um, the comments from some of those opposite during uh, their contributions, uh, particularly around firefighting, I, I found quite amazing. We heard from a, a, an actual aerial firefighter, Senator Molan, talking about how good we are, how well we are prepared with our aerial firefighting fleets. The government is working with states and territories to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission. And it's important to note that uh, 128 out of 158 aircraft that are used for firefighting are Australian owned and operated. Uh, it was, it was a, quite amazing, I found, before uh, Senator Watt, who was uh, very, very active during question time on some of these issues and is the Shadow Minister for Emergency Management, has only just this last week just this last week, accepted an invitation for a briefing with Emergency, Emergency Management Australia on our seasonal preparation. So, again, Senator Urquhart moving this MPI prior to that briefing just further demonstrates that Labor are simply not interested in facts. The Labor Party are not interested in how well prepared Australia actually is. And those decisions have left Victoria at a substantially higher risk now and into the future. Mr Acting Deputy President, earlier this year I spoke about the impacts of bushfires on my home state in Victoria and how, along with Victoria's first responders, the ADF had made a vital contribution to the safety and welfare of Victorians. Now, we, as we all should in this place, know that emergency management is primarily a state or territory responsibility. And certainly during COVID, it was brought into stake, stark um, uh, contrast the difference between states and what states were managing and what the Commonwealth had to manage. And we sh but, however, we saw right through the, both the COVID crisis and the earlier bushfire crisis in the year, the Australian government ensured that everyone had support, or was at least offered support, by the ADF. The Morrison government has substantially reformed national disaster payments and implemented the Emergency Response Fund and increased Australia's aerial firefighting responsibility. You have to remember that the funding that we've put forward, the Emergency Response Fund, is for response and recovery. So to claim we haven't spent any of that money is simply ridiculous. The fund, the $4 billion fund, is set up to spend up to $150 million, uh, per, uh, $200 million per year on various things. And just this uh, last month, the, uh, the Minister for Disaster Recovery, Minister Little Proud, has uh, signed off on signing some of those funds to go out the door. Now, with the Emergency Response Fund, the Labor Party voted for the establishment of that fund, knowing full well that the circumstances in which it can be accessed. And so, as I mentioned, the $150 million each financial year to fund emergency response and recovery is when the, de the government determines that existing recovery programs are insufficient to meet the scale. And the further $50 million to, to in each financial year is to build resilience, and that comes to prepare or reduce the risk of future natural disasters. 
Mr Acting Deputy President, we know that uh, Labor don't understand these things, but I think we can see that this motion was a farce. Thank you. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it.